Good afternoon, everybody. It's going to be tough for me to end the, the session after all the great speakers you heard today. Um, I was supposed to give you a rundown on Service Mesh, but honestly, after I heard everything you heard today, you probably know everything there is to know about Service Mesh. So I'm going to try to spin it into something interesting, which is we actually put what you've seen here today, three years ago, on jets, bombers, space systems, and even nuclear systems. So we had to deal with airworthiness, we had to deal with nuclear surety, and we've done this uh, three years ago on U-2 and F-16s that were um, you know, 60 to 70 year years old. So you can imagine the complexity of having to deal with um, embedded systems with limited compute, but also obviously weapons on board, and sensors and decoupling you know, flight controls from the actual uh, AI machine learning capabilities we were trying to deploy on the jets. So when we started the uh, DoD Enterprise DevSecOps engagement back in 2018, we created the largest uh, community of practice and partnered across industry, brought 750 companies to get feedback. And we deployed Kubernetes on jets and containers uh, four years ago. And so at the time, most people in the, in the department thought, first, he's a French guy in the building, you know, make sure you arrest him. Two, uh, they said, well, you know, if you want to ship containers to Afghanistan, we know how to do that. But that's pretty much the extent of what we know about containers. And when, that, when I told them about, hey, it's, sh shipping con it's not shipping containers, it's software uh, containers, you know, people look at me like I was uh, even more crazy than after hearing my accent. So, you can imagine the complexity of, of really getting to understand the benefit of taking what used to be these monolithic complex systems and turn them into modular, flexible capabilities. And so we have three main pillars of cybersecurity that we use to be able to get high assurance in cybersecurity in those uh, weapon systems. The first one is what we call Moving target defense. And moving target defense is a concept of cattle versus pet, right? So containers versus virtual machine. Uh, the cattle, you shoot it behind the barn and you kill it multiple times a day. A VM, it's a pet, you care for it, you, you heal it if it's sick, right? And so we moved to containers and embraced the concept of, hey, we're gonna actually kill containers every four hours. We're gonna be highly available and we're going to do it so that if a malicious actor gets a foothold in the containers, they lose everything they've done every four hours. So that already limits the ability of a malicious actor to move laterally between enclaves and containers. So that's the first pillar, this kind of concept of ephemeral container and always moving network, right? IP changes, everything changes all the time. It was pretty exciting, but then we added right, the zero trust aspect of things, and I was part of the team that brought zero trust you know, with Google, first at DHS uh, seven years ago, and, and then at, in DoD with the largest implementation of zero trust four years ago, which really is enforcing right, need to know, and, and this uh, demonstration you've seen today where you see uh, granular whitelisting and, and traffic access to resources based on need to know and based on uh, you know, the user information, the device being used. So in DoD, you know, we had to worry about what device do you use, who you are, and the data. Right? So it's data-centric. We were able to label data down to the cell level. Uh, so the who could be TSSCI, but the what would be you know, SecRel. But then we also had the notion of the device. So based if you use a personal device, a mobile device, uh, a government furnished device, you will have different access based on you know, what you're supposed to be able to see. And then of course we had the user, which defines based on labels and roles, what you're supposed to be able to, to see as well. So when you compound all this and you add you know, the time of the day, the geofencing, you get a pretty good zero trust uh, policy enforcement layer, where now you are able to really have a, have a very well defined uh, whitelisting uh, you know, uh, aspect of, of control to, to data. And so we're able to build this in three months. 
get accredited, which is always fun. And then when we, we did that, we, we were able to, to start piloting this on not just website and, and cloud stuff, but you know, weapons, right? And so that's the second pillar, of zero trust. And of course, the mesh has been the essential piece, right? Because if you're moving from a monolithic system to containers, well, then you need to also decide what container can talk to what container. And we move all databases and every component of the stack as containers. And so if everything is containerized, well, obviously you need to make sure that uh, you control access between containers. And so we used uh, the service mesh with Istio back in 2018 to do uh, mutual TLS enforcement you know, with granular access control uh, for the for the east-west traffic between containers, and so, okay, you, you get the ingress, you get the egress, you get the east-west uh, enforcement. So you're, you're in pretty good shape. You're reducing the ability of a malicious actor to laterally move to the crown jewels, right? You're only limiting, you know, if, if there is a zero day in one of the containers, obviously the malicious actor is only able to laterally move to the containers that are, you know, accessible by this container. So you know, drastic reduction of risk and attack surface. So that was great. That's the second pillar. The third pillar is continuous monitoring with behavior prevention. It's a fancy way of saying we started using AI to look at the behavior of the containers. And if they started to do things like connecting to things or trying to uh, open ports or, or, or uh, exfiltrate data to things, we would be able to uh, proactively kill the container to go back to immutable state and prevent you know, the malicious actor from sending data outside of the, the stack. So now you have three layers of security between moving target defense, zero trust, and uh, continuous monitoring with behavior uh, prevention. The, the beauty of the mesh in this case is also helping you um, centralized logs and telemetry of all these containers into a central place so that you have visibility in what's going on so that your uh, behavior prevention mechanism can actually see what's going on uh, without having to inject log capabilities on a per container basis. Because if you have a team moving and embracing the concept of containers, you want to be able to have options, right? And so you want to be able to let people decide what tools work for them. And so as a former chief software officer, and I was the first CSO in the government, uh, you know, we, we, we were in charge of building the DevSecOps platform and cloud. So we built the largest cloud office with Cloud One and Platform One with DevSecOps, which is a, you know, about a billion a year in DevSecOps, which is a lot of money. And you know, when you start looking at the, the complexity of different missions, and different tools you need, different programming languages, different databases. There are things you want to be flexible, and there are things you want to be opinionated, right? And you don't want everybody to do whatever they want to do just for the, the heck of you know, doing it and personal preference, but you also want to give the best tool to get the job done. And so the balance between the two is always interesting, right? Because people will come and say, oh, you know, I really want this tool, right? And, and then you have to decide, okay, am I, am I going to bring it as an enterprise uh, solution? So we created Iron Bank, right, the repository of containers for the DoD that are actually open sourced and you can actually use. And Iron Bank is centrally accredited and we have a thousand plus containers and we centrally accredit the containers and we enable reuse of you know, programming languages, databases, operating systems and different tools, including commercial tools as well to be like titrate, you know, that you've seen today. So, so now you have the ability to consume and get the best tool for the job. That's all great, but then the question is, okay, but, but what's the limitation when it comes to cyber, right? Because if you move to zero trust and you want to embrace this high assurance concept of software, you know, you're going to look at software bill of materials, you're going to scan your code, you're going to look at CVEs, all great things, kind of stuck in time based on you know, already known vulnerabilities, which let's face it, there's a lot of zero days out there, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. Uh, potentially, companies could have their own DevSecOps platform uh, hacked, which you know, compromises the binary like you've seen with SolarWinds, 
And so that opens the door to a lot of uh, you know, issues when it comes to trust and provenance and integrity. And so you, know, you start looking at tools and you start thinking, well, if I have too many tools, it's a cyber issue. It's also a cost problem. But then if I have not enough uh, capabilities to help my teams do their jobs, I'm failing at my job too. So the balance is, of course, you know, pretty interesting. You look at programming languages, we had 16 uh, programming languages. When it comes to databases, we had 23 databases, right? very flexible. But then when it came to zero trust enforcement and a policy enforcement uh, point, a PEP, we had only one because you know, we want to have uh, enforcement across the enterprise. And if you start federating policy enforcement point, well, guess what? You can do zero trust because well, you're just trusting someone else PEP. And so if you're just trusting someone else PEP, well, you're not doing zero trust because it's just blind trust, right? And so we, we were pretty opinionated when it came to cyber with some of the key components that included identity management, right? Both for the, the people side, the person entity side, and the non-person entity side, so the bots accounts, right? And being able to have container A talk to B, right? Those are all identities for, for each container. They are short-lived, you know, they are um, ephemeral, and they rotate quickly. Um, and and the, the beauty there is, is you have the same level of enforcement of your access control and effectively the same visibility across the enterprise. So that's a great benefit for cyber and assurance. Then you add to that you know, a couple of SBOM scanning, CV scanning, and so we had a couple of uh, tools that we uh, mandated, and we had two scanning tools because we found that uh, you know, one always had a lot of false positives, and then the other two, and they were always uh, fighting with each other, and at the end of the day, you don't know which one to trust, so might as well get two and compare. So we couldn't just trust one scanning tool, so you know, we had you know, Twistlock, Aqua, you know, Encore, whatever, right? Pick your poison. And that gives you the, 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 the continuous uh, scanning, right, of containers, CVs, and, and so on. And then we added, right, the, the runtime piece, which is, I think, the most important piece, which is, uh, you know, looking at behavior of containers and then deciding, you know, what uh, to allow. And if you see patterns or if you see activity that's not normal, then it kills the container and alert the team and, and go back to immutable state. So malicious actor have a attack surface you know, really reduced, but then also on, on top of that, um, you know, they, they lose everything they're doing every, every four hours. And oh, by the way, they, they also lose if they, do t if they make too much noise, they go back again to, to square one. So it's it just, you, you're doing everything to you know, mitigate the impact on your system. And so what we did, you know, when we put on jets, and we did the first ever uh, fly of a jet where we did software over the air updates while flying the jet with no impact to the airworthiness of the aircraft. And so we flew the jet with a U2 jet, which has a bunch of, bunch of sensors on it. And we put AI capabilities that used to be, you know, those, those sensors used to be managed by humans. And so now the human can focus on other things and the AI is able to, you know, move the sensors according to the mission. And so we were able to bring that on legacy hardware on the legacy 70-year-old you know, U2 jet. That's pretty cool. But the essence of what enabled us to do this is the decoupling between the mission containers and the AI stuff and the flight control stuff. So by cutting and having uh, you know, very well-defined um, boundaries and um, you know, continuization stacks, we can actually know exactly what is used to do what, and we can know which containers are essential for the airworthiness of the aircraft. Just like Netflix has, you know, 750 containers, but only 20 are needed to watch a movie, right? If the other containers go down, they're going to have caching, and they're going to have different things. Maybe some features are going to go away, but it's not going to stop you from watching the movie. We kind of embrace the same concept, right, which is really trying to understand which of these containers are essential to the mission and which ones are nice to have. And then you can you know, do some caching and, and all the cool stuff we do. So that gives you a good insight when it comes to high assurance and how we bring this into the largest behemoth, that is the DoD, 
on system that you know most people would argue was impossible to begin with. So I guess if we can do it, so can you. And I think we have four minutes for questions. And even if the app is not working, we can take questions live. So just speak up. I don't care. I'm breaking the rules. Don't be shy. Yep. As far as this on, I can hear you anyway. Yeah. So anyway, um, for encouraging, um, so that's great that Iron Bank was developed. Um, what are ways that you encourage the open source community? In that case, if, uh, if someone in, in, in that case to contribute to Iron Bank to um, uh, and to use that power of the open source community to be able to. Um, keep up and, uh, you know, like look at any um, uh, deficiencies or something that comes up with uh, one of those container images. How do you encourage Yeah, that? it's tough, right? Because the commercial companies, obviously, they have interest because they want to do business with DOD and we accelerate their path to ATO. So they, they want to put their containers on Iron Bank. When it comes to open source, they, have, they don't care, obviously. Uh, in fact, many don't want to do business with DOD. And don't want to don't want their stuff to be used uh, by the gov by the government, which I, I don't really care, anyways. Uh, but so what we had to do is often fund um, contractors to do the work, and we, you know which I think is good for the government to give back to open source communities. We're going to use it. We're going to consume it. So why not also fix issues and you know proactively contribute back? And a lot of agencies struggle with that, right? They, there's a lot of uh, uh, pretty cumbersome processes to have people contribute back to the government. So we did a policy to uh, explain that you know uh, uh, people can contribute to open source projects, including government employees and not just contractors. But the fact is, it's true that most of the people doing it were contractors. Uh, Platform One had 300 people. I would say uh, 20 feds and <laughs> 280 uh, contractors. The, the other key piece, right, of, of the staffing. Um, to make sure we, we're not getting locked into one company, we had value streams in Platform One cut into you know, two pizza teams, and um, uh, never one company was in charge of the entire value stream. So it was always teams comprised of multiple companies. In fact, we had you know, 100 companies on contract in Platform One. So really, we never had this notion of a prime. The, 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 the government was always the uh, integration team and the lead and the uh, product owner of each product as a, as a government employee. And then you know, the, the staffing was comprised of best of breed of, of different companies based on the skill needed for that team. So we never had you know, one company rule the show. I think that's very important. You know, companies might not like it. I don't care. But the fact is it's, it's a better way to not get locked into one company, get diversity of options and opinions, and, and, and flexibility when it comes to the technology and have options, right? So I think that was a great success. But again, you know, back to your question, open source, you have to lead the way. You can you can't expect them to do it. They probably won't. In fact, if you look at the cybersecurity of many open source projects, it's despicable, right? You look at Kubeflow, you look at you know many of these open source projects which we ended up using. I had to fund 20 plus million bucks, by the way, sometimes to contribute back and fix all this stuff uh, upstream. You know, hundreds of CVs. Including sometimes you know CVs that existed before they even started the, the project and was patched before they started the project to tell you how little they cared about about cyber. They just picked whatever version. They didn't even look at hey, there's already a patch for this when they created the the project. You know, so it, I think it's very important to do that and to give back because let's face it, right? People don't realize, but 60% of all software, anyways, open source nowadays, including commercial software, you just don't know about it. So you know, might as well give back and, and, and make sure we have the best of breed and, and the best security. Oh, I'm supposed to look on the, on the laptop, I guess. We're on the screen. All right. So how can organizations get to CATO certification outside of Cloud One and Platform One? Is it largely up to individual AOs? Or is there a growing consensus on standards? So for DoD, we actually released a, a CATO uh, policy. It's pretty good. I wrote most of it, but it was a little bit tweaked. I added a little bit of bottlenecks, but that's okay. Um, but you know, there, is, there is a DoD policy you can get, and you can reuse that for other agencies. So the concept is really based on the, on the NIST 
uh, continuous uh, monitoring uh, framework, part of the NIST uh, cyber framework. So it's already well understood. And we have this notion of you know, accrediting multiple times a day. And we have all these, uh, you know, the platform has to be accredited, right, with all the gates for your source code, the scanning, the, the runtime, all the stuff we talked about, right? And obviously, platform one is an accelerator because we built it all into platform one. But the fact is, it's, it's something you can rebuild. Platform one is also open source, so you could just take platform one and run. People use platform one Big Bang you know, across NATO and a lot of agencies nowadays, so you could also do that and not rebuild the stuff. So uh, that's my answer here. When using multi-scanning approaches due to lack of trust on one, how do you correlate the results to analyze the findings? How do you deal with deviation? There's actually a lot of products that are starting to do this pretty well. When we started, we had to build our own product called the uh, uh, Vulnerability Assessment Tool, VAT. And the VAT is, is cor 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 correlates the results across scanners, de deduplicates um, you know, uh, redundant findings, and then we have a, a manual review of the false positives and the, um, the issues, and, and they have to be uh, mitigated or you know, reviewed. But then when there's new update of the container, you know, unless you bring in new CVEs, you don't have to do it again. So it's a one-time thing unless there's a new set of CVEs, and then you, have to, you only have to review the delta, right, the new stuff that's co coming up on the scanner. So we, we built this tool. I, I know they, I'm blanking on the names, but there's a couple of products now that do this pretty well. I think there's one in Aqua, there's probably one in um, Twistlock and others. They, they aggregate the findings of other scanners as well. Um, why do you perceive as the biggest obstacle to broader service mesh architecture adoption? Training, you know, I think it's, it's uh, a fear, it's, it's uh, monolithic architectures, right? I, I think once you move to containers and you give the flexibility to people, it's impossible to succeed without a service mesh. It's not an option not to have it. I, I would say both in, in terms of cybersecurity, but also in terms of velocity and enabling teams to be decoupled, right? If you have different programming languages and you have different teams using different tools, and you have logs and telemetry, and you have to inject all that manually for each language, it's a nightmare. The service mesh injects you know, a, a, a reverse proxy to, to collect all the logs and telemetry, and so having that baked in is, is a game changer. You have to be crazy to, to move to containers and not use service mesh. So, so my take is it's, it's a maturity thing, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a knowledge and training thing, but once you move to containers and you understand the value of containers, and by the way, I have a video on YouTube you know, about Kubernetes, and I, I even make the point that uh, uh, Kubernetes is a must even if you think it's overkill. And, and it's interesting, right, because I think the benefit of Kubernetes in cyber are enough to justify using it if, even if you think you don't need it just because of the cyber benefits long term on having it, right? Just on the, on the visibility, the enforcement, the admission controller, all the stuff we can do with Kubernetes and containers and high availability, resiliency, right? All the cyber benefits of Kubernetes, and we, we list that in the video, and we think it's enough, you know, by itself to justify using it, which obviously once you move to, to Kubernetes, um, you know, for us, we actually mandated in the duty enterprise DevSecOps reference design, we have the service mesh mandated. It's not an, op an option not to have it if you want to get a CATO. Uh, that's how important it is to be able to, to scale and to get the baked in security. Because you know, otherwise, it's bolted on security, and that never works. right? You want to have that baked in stuff from day, day one. And so I think it's a game changer. And you know, I, I think it's also uh, preventing you from getting locked into to one set of, of products or, or things. So it's, it's also give you flexibility to decouple you know, yourself from, from logging and, and other tools, because now you're abstracted and you have this um, easy way to swap things and try new things.